All right, thanks everyone for coming today to this series of talks, which is an update about the ISRM workshop this summer. And the first talk today will be by Nicholas Triantafilou, uh, who's speaking about computing isolated points on modular curves. Um, and Nicholas, is it all right if we put this talk on YouTube afterwards? Sounds good. Yeah, we'll take it away. All right, thank you very much for the invitation, Rachel and Drew. It's a real honor to uh, get to kick off this uh, series of Vantage. I think I've been watching Vantage since back before COVID hit um, and been enjoying it uh, an awful lot this whole time. Um, so everything that I'm talking about uh, today is joint work with Khan Bilgin, Arthava Korde, Michelle Manis, Travis Morrison, Matthias Giusti, this is Maya Sankar, or, um, Bianca Varai, and David Zurich Brown. Uh, so let's get started. So we've got a couple of words here in the title that we uh, need to talk about a little bit. First, we'll uh, motivate studying modular curves for anyone who uh, isn't as familiar with those. And then we'll jump into talking about isolated points uh, a bit later. And so to start with talking about modular curves, I want to remind you of two famous uh, theorems uh, about the structure of uh, torsion on elliptic curves. So first there's uh, Mazur's torsion theorem from 1978, which proved that the, uh, the Q points of the torsion or the torsion of the, the Q points, the rational points on an elliptic curve can only be one of uh, these 15 possibilities. Uh, and maybe slightly less well-known, but also, also quite well-known uh, is the isogeny theorem, which says that the, uh, the possible cyclic subgroups uh, of the elliptic curve, which can be defined over Q, uh, range over this somewhat larger set, uh, but still uh, a fairly finite list of options. And so here, when we say that the cyclic subgroup of order n is defined over Q, we don't mean that the individual points are defined over Q. We can see from the torsion theorem that that often won't be the case, but rather that the, uh, the elements of the cyclic subgroup uh, form our, our, our Galois conjugate. They're closed under the action of the Galois group. But how do you really think about this? Uh, well, as an arithmetic geometer, I like to think about it geometrically, and I think that's the, the popular viewpoint, which is to say that there uh, is an object which parameterizes elliptic curves uh, equipped with a choice of uh, a subgroup uh, isomorphic to Z mod NZ, a cyclic subgroup of order N up to isomorphism. All right, and what is this object that parameterizes this? Well, it's the modular curve uh, x naught of n. Um, and OK, it's not, not a, quite a perfect uh, matchup. There are some cusps, some extra points, which correspond to uh, degenerations uh, of these elliptic curves. But roughly speaking, this is, this is uh, the object. And uh, another way of, of saying Mazur's isogeny theorem uh, would be that the set of rational points on x naught of n is contained in the set of cusps uh, unless n is uh, in this finite set uh, of numbers, which are all uh, at most 163. And so we understand uh, quite well the, uh, the rational points on uh, these modular curves of, uh, uh, yeah. Um, another nice thing about this structure is where these elliptic curves exist, we have parameterizations. So if this modular curve is genus zero, then we have uh, a P1 uh, worth of elliptic curves with a cyclic subgroup of order N defined over Q. If the a modular curve is uh, an elliptic curve of positive rank, then uh, we could put the structure of a finitely generated abelian group uh, on these 
uh, elliptic curves of the cyclic subgroup of order n. We can parameterize them by these q points on an elliptic curve. And the remaining case is if we have a higher genus curve or uh, an elliptic curve of rank zero, we're left with a finite set. Uh, so all of this is to say that we understand rational points on these, uh, these modular curves, uh, x naught of n, which corresponds to the cyclic subgroup of order n, uh, and x1 of n, which corresponds to a torsion point of order n. We understand these quite well at least when it comes to the Q points. So what about uh, over number fields? What happens if we uh, change from Q and allow uh, points over uh, higher degree fields? And there's a lot of, uh, quite a lot that's known about uh, the torsion subgroup. So in 96, Morel proved that if you fix uh, the degree or are you bound to the degree of the number field, then there are only finitely many possibilities for the torsion subgroup of the K points uh, on the elliptic curve. So as you range over all elliptic curves, over all number fields of degree at most D, you still have only finitely many possibilities uh, for the torsion subgroup. And that, uh, of course, asks a very natural question, which is what, uh, which subgroups appear. Um, and this has been uh, completely classified in two cases. So in the degree two case, quadratic fields, this was classified in the 1980s by Kamieni, Kenku, and Mamos. Um, in 2004, uh, John, Kim, and Schweitzer answered the question uh, of which uh, torsion subgroups appear infinitely often over cubic fields. So thinking things that are maybe parameterized by a, a P1 or the rational points on a positive rank elliptic curve. And uh, just very recently, at Tropolsky, Morrow, Zurich, Brown, Derricks, and Van Hoge finished the classification uh, of cubic points on uh, the X1 modular curves. So finish the classification, I guess, of the torsion subgroups of elliptic curves over cubic fields. Uh, and so they found, well, they didn't find, but there's one extra possibility that doesn't appear infinitely often, this very mysterious uh, point on X1 of 21 that Nyman found in, in 2014. Um, and so like this point is very interesting. It sort of doesn't seem to uh, appear for a geometric reason. Um, and there are some other interesting points I think as well that don't necessarily fit into uh, parameterized families. And those sorts of points will be the, the topic of our uh, the rest of our talk for today. So we're going to leave the, the full torsion subgroup behind and go back to uh, X naught of N, um, parameterizing these uh, cyclic subgroups defined over Q. Um, but first we'll take uh, a detour to define the other, uh, the other mysterious word from the title of our talk, the word isolated. So isolated points, uh, I think the definition first appears in a fairly recent paper of Burdan, Eider, Liu, Odomodu, and Varai. Uh, and as a starting point, we'll take X to be a nice curve, uh, so smooth, proper, and geometrically integral. I just think of something uh, nice, algebra geometric curve. And uh, for convenience, let's equip it with a rational point. We'll see why in a moment. And now this is true in general, not just for um, not just for curves, but the degree D points on X are basically going to correspond to rational points on the dth symmetric power of X. So this is the product of X with itself, D times, quotiented out 
by the symmetric group of order D. And so how you should think of this is that um, a degree D point on X sort of corresponds to the set of all of its conjugates. And now the symmetric power also has some other points. Say if you had a rational point, you could take uh, D copies of that rational point would also live there. So you need to be a little bit careful. We can't write an equal sign, but uh, the point is that we can understand degree D points on X by understanding rational points on a higher dimensional variety. And this is one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, you know, when I'm not working on this project, I like to uh, replace K points on, on curves with the restriction of scalars and try to compute them with Chabotis method, things like this, or even to, to do similar things with the symmetric power. All right, so what are we gonna do now that we've uh, parameterized our, our points as the rational points on some variety? We're, now we'll take advantage of the fact that we have a curve uh, equipped with a rational point. And so this allows us, uh, you might be familiar that we can map the curve into its Jacobian, it's an abelian variety to find over Q, uh, which parametrizes degree zero divisors on X. So we can map the curve into its Jacobian uh, by taking a point P to the class of P minus this fixed P naught. Uh, but more generally, we can map, uh, we can get a map from the dth symmetric power to the Jacobian uh, that takes a, a d tuple uh, of points or a set of d points to the sum of the points minus d times our fixed, uh, our fixed point on the curve. And so this map is no longer an embedding. Uh, so it's not quite as nice as the map uh, of the the curve to its Jacobian, but it's still quite nice. So the fibers of this map are uh, isomorphic to Pn uh, for some n, uh, a positive, positive integer. And in fact, it's not so hard to compute what these are using linear systems, at least, at least in theory. Uh, when x gets complicated and d gets large, it can be more difficult in practice. Uh, and the, the other nice fact is that the image of this variety, the image of this map is a subvariety of an abelian variety. So by Faulting's theorem, we know that the rational points on that image are contained in, first of all, a finite union of translates of abelian subvarieties with positive rank. Um, and then there are finitely many additional points. Uh, that uh, lie in the image, but don't lie on an abelian, a translate of an abelian variety of positive rank that's uh, contained in the image. And so I've got a little picture of this, uh, how you might imagine this would look. If you take, uh, maybe this is a, a surface, so maybe it's D equals two. And we see in the picture that there are these uh, fibers in green, which contract down to points. So we've got some projective spaces there, uh, another one over here, uh, contracting down to uh, this green point on the right. And then we have, uh, abelian varieties. Looks like maybe there are elliptic curves in this case, which I always like to draw as uh, straight lines because you can imagine straightening them out uh, using a logarithm or something like that. And then we have these finitely many points scattered around uh, the picture, uh, which are the gold that we're going to be hunting for. Nicholas, there's a question in the chat about whether the D in the union is the same as the D in sim D from Andrew Obis. I don't know. Oh, that's a great question, Andrew. No, it's not. Um, that uh, maybe let's just say E, give it a different letter. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Yeah, there's no reason why uh, the number of translates of abelian varieties should have, uh, should be equal to the dimension. I think it, it can definitely be a totally different number. 
Thank you. All right, so let's just summarize what we've said. Uh, and basically we've said the degree D points on X are equal to uh, P1 parametrized points. So these are the points uh, where the fibers are positive dimensional. So they might be uh, you know, parametrized by a, a higher projective space, but you could break that up into P1s. We've got the uh, abelian variety parametrized points, these pink points. Um, and then we've got the isolated points, which are a finite set. And that's something that we can really get our hands on and compute. So the goal uh, of this project that we started at ISERM um, and that is still ongoing is uh, to compute and study the isolated points in all degrees, as many degrees as we can, at least on X naught of N, where the rank of the Jacobian is equal to zero. And so the nice thing about that, well, one thing is that if the Jacobian has rank zero, it certainly can't have any positive rank abelian subvarieties. So there aren't any abelian variety parametrized points. Um, and the other nice thing will be that the Jacobian will be torsion. So we have a sort of a finite set of fibers to look over. Um, and as we go through this, we'd like to ask lots of questions. Like, are the isolated points all cusps? That would be kind of boring. Are they CM points? Do they correspond to elliptic curves with extra, uh, extra isomorphism or endomorphisms? We might expect that those curves would be defined over low degree number fields. Maybe this is a good way to find them. Um, or might they be Q curves, curves that are isogenous or they have maps to all of their Galois conjugates. Uh, so again, it might be an interesting place to look for examples. Uh, it would be really neat if these uh, had sort of a more Q curves among them than you would expect uh, for random curves or something, something like that. But in general, these are pretty mysterious points. So I'd like to roughly outline our strategy. So taking advantage of the fact that we've restricted to a rank zero Jacobians, uh, our first goal would be to compute the torsion subgroups. Um, and I think this is an area that we have a lot of room for improvement on. Uh, and the second step, once you've computed the torsion points, you can iterate uh, over points in your Jacobian and really compute these riemann rock spaces. So just computing all of the effective divisors, which are uh, linearly equivalent to uh, this given divisor. And so, well, the nice thing if, is that we can determine if a point is isolated uh, just by this computation. If the dimension of the riemann rock space is zero, uh, there are uh, no points. It's not a, a point in the image of the symmetric power. If uh, the dimension is one, we have an isolated point. And if the dimension is at least two, it's P1 parametrized. So again, taking advantage of the fact that there are no uh, abelian variety parametrized points uh, in this setup. Uh, and just, I'll mention really quickly that um, there are uh, very neat conjectures about the torsion subgroup uh, of the rational points on the Jacobian of these modular curves. So the conjecture is that this subgroup is always equal to uh, the lower bound of the subgroup generated by the cusps. Uh, and you might try to prove that that's the case uh, by uh, computing the, uh, the reduction modulo p. We know the prime to p torsion injects uh, into the, the p torsion on the Jacobian. Um, but in general, this upper bound is not tight. Um, it's sort of a, a generalized Ogg's conjecture to prove this in general, although I think it may be known in the case that uh, n 
is a prime. All right, uh, so we've got a few minutes left. So I'd like to talk about our current progress um, and the, the progress of uh, some others before us. So I should say, uh, before I, I mention this, that the x naught curves are generally a, a little more difficult to deal with to do classification than the torsion subgroups, just because uh, their, their genus stays lower for longer, they're not as complicated geometrically for a long time, which means there are many, many more cases that you have to address. Uh, but nevertheless, there has been some progress uh, studying these modular curves with rank zero Jacobians. So Brun and Nyman found all of the quadratic points on hyperelliptic x naught of n. So that's when uh, x naught of n is equipped with a two to one map to projective space. Uh, and in that case, you expect there to be lots of quadratic points. Um, so you, you get sort of a P1 parameterized family from this uh, hyperelliptic map. Uh, and then there can be some other points uh, here and there. And uh, building on this, Osman and Siksek uh, also quite recently computed all of the quadratic points on the non hyperelliptic uh, X naught of n in genus three, four, and five. So these will be some isolated points. And so we've pushed beyond these computations. And I want to just tell you how you can read this table that I've sorted the modular curves uh, with a rank zero Jacobian by their genus. So you see a list of n's in white uh, for each genus up to six. And uh, we've got a check mark if we've computed the isolated points in all degrees. So you, you only have to look up to the degree uh, equal to the genus because beyond that, uh, all points will be P1 parameterized. Uh, by structure results on, on Jacobians, how you construct Jacobians. Uh, and so we also have some entries in the table uh, with uh, inequalities indicating that we've computed uh, points up to that degree. Uh, so in a couple of cases, we've only computed, uh, recomputed the quadratic points or computed the cubic points, uh, isolated points. And we have a few especially in genus five that are labeled uh, by torsion, which means that, well, if it's green, we've completed the computation uh, conditionally on uh, the cuspidal subgroup being equal to the full, uh, the full Q rational torsion subgroup. And so in genus two, these maybe aren't new results because Brune and Nyman uh, computed the quadratic points on all the hyperelliptic modular curves. But once we get to uh, genus three, we have new results uh, in degree three. Uh, in genus four, we have new results in, de in degree three and degree four. Um, and we even have a couple of the cases in, uh, in genus five, where we have new results in degree three, four, and five. Uh, it turns out that this the, the only modular curve of uh, X naught of N of genus six, which has a rank zero Jacobian, uh, is hyperelliptic. And that actually makes it a little bit easier to carry out these computations. We're able to compute the isolated points all the way up to degree six. And so, you know, we have a lot more information behind beyond just the number of points. We can really nail down minimal polynomials of J invariants all sorts of other information that you might want to know about these curves. And so just as we close, I wanna say what's coming up next uh, with this project. And I think one thing that we'd really like to do is continue these computations and look more for the patterns, look really analyze, are we getting a lot of uh, Q curves? I know we've done a little bit of that. Uh, we got some help from Drew looking that over. Um, are we getting a lot of CM curves, that sort of thing? But there's a big technical, uh, a big technical piece will be computing these torsion subgroups uh, of these modular curves or their Jacobians and improving our Riemann-Roch computations. So 
when the degree is less than the genus, you could try to use like a Mordell Vasiv and use information at different primes to cut out uh, bits of the computation. Uh, when degree is equal to genus, you expect every point uh, to be either isolated or P1 parameterized. Um, so Mordell Vasiving isn't going to get you as much, but maybe we can sieve sort of using information from lower degree. Um, and something that's near and dear to my heart is to uh, extend beyond the rank zero case, try to get uh, to the rank one or even higher rank case, uh, where you might be able to use piadic methods like Chabotis method uh, to cut out a, a locus, uh, to really cut out this abelian variety parameterized locus, to cut out uh, the P1 parameterized and sporadic locus as uh, an additional finite set. Uh, of, of points on the abelian variety um, using sort of piadic analytic equations and solving those equations. Uh, and it would be really cool if we could, you know, eventually prove something like uh, to the effect that the, the set of degree D sporadic J invariants on the X naught of N uh, is bounded. So uh, there are some results like this uh, conditional on some hypotheses, I believe, but some results like this for X one of N. Uh, so I'd love to hear any questions that uh, you have about this project, about what we've got going on. Uh, Thank you, Nicholas. That's wonderful. Uh, 